Hey guys, my name is Dove. I'm so excited to talk about what we're going to talk about today, which is now one of my favorite books and the best debut novel I have probably ever read, In Memoriam by Alice Wynn. I think the easiest way to describe this book to you is that it is Dead Poet Society engages in trench warfare written like Song of Achilles. <laughs> okay, this is a queer historical romance that takes place in World War I between two private boarding school boys who find themselves in the midst of the Great War. I'm going to start off this video with a spoiler-free review uh, just to, for me to try to convince you to read this book. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about the movie 1917 because there's a quite a bit of parallels and overlap between the two. So favorite World War I book paired with favorite World War I movie. Um, we're going to start this off with no spoilers, but the bulk of this video is going to be an in-depth analysis of the book. So I will let you know when to shut it off, go read the book, go watch the movie, and then come back to finish. So this book has actually been on my TBR for a few months now. I, if you saw my video where I reorganized all of my books, I talk a lot about Powell's books and how much I trust their staff recommendations. Every year at the end of the year, they get a list of all of their staff members' top five books of the year. Um, and they have this thing where if a single book gets into five different people's top five for the year, it actually gets its own separate blog post just to talk about that book. It's only happened a couple times before. The last time was in 2022, but it happened in February of this year after their 2023 uh, <laughs> year in review that In Memoriam was on five different staff members' top five. I heard the premise. I said, I absolutely need this book. When I was at Powell's a couple weeks ago, I saw that they had come out with this really beautiful soft cover version. I don't want the hardbacks ever, you guys. <laughs> um, and I had to grab it. When I tell you, I devoured this book, okay? I came home Sunday afternoon. I started it that evening. I finished it midday Monday. Like, I, I, think I, I think I read this thing in, like, less than 24 hours, if we're being honest. Also, uh, as you can see, I do have a lot of thoughts and feelings and things to say about it. Is my flagging in this book perhaps a little bit excessive? Maybe. <laughs> but I would argue that the book is so excessively exquisite that it warrants it. Also, I wanted to be able... I actually went through and, like, added some flags after the fact and I switched things around as I got further in the book and realized like more of the reoccurring themes but I also thought that the flags would be a really good visual representation to show you about how often things are brought up and the recurring themes so I do want to say all of the red colored there we go all of the red colored flags uh, are referring to PTSD and trauma and I feel like you actually can't see all of the black flags because a lot of them overlap, but there is a lot of death in this book, and frankly, I only flagged the notable ones. There's a lot more that happen. Um, with that, okay, let me get into my review. Okay, no spoilers in this review, but this is a five-star read. Okay, this is a five-star read. Um, like I said, this is like Dead Poet Society meets Song of Achilles. The yearning incredible okay this is genuinely a very very romantic historical romance i think it might be one of the best historical romances i've ever read um but at the same time the book itself is about these two people and their experiences in the war and it very much does not use its genre as a cop-out to fully explore the devastation of it so our two main characters are Henry Heinrich Gaunt and Sidney Elwood, who are both private school boys at a private school called Preshoot. I think that's how you would say it. Gaunt is the older of the two, and he's what I would consider to be a very scrappy pacifist. He also has very socialist leanings in his own personal political beliefs. Um, but despite his like general gentle demeanor, the thing that he does have on his side that protects him from any type of adversity that he faces is his physical strength. And he gets into a lot of fights. His 
his physical ability is what has been able to protect him from scrutiny of other boys, from other people, from the shame that he feels inside about his own queerness. It gives him an outlet to run from that because we all know how men feel <laughs> about punching each other is that is a way for them to hold on to their masculinity. So Gott's family is German. He was actually born in Berlin and they moved to England when he was very, very young. So although he has spent most of his life in England, he's very much culturally German and also spent many summers back in Berlin with his family. And it's for this reason that his family are actually the people who pressure him into joining the war effort in order to you know, really prove their allegiance to England now that his dad is starting to get questioned at the bank that he works at. It's really a shame because Gaunt, again, is a pacifist. He has no interest in being a part of this war at all. He wants to go to college and study ancient Greek literature because that's what he's most interested in. Our other main character is Sidney Elwood, who I will probably mostly refer to as Ellie throughout this video because that's most often how he's referred to in the book. Um, but he's a year younger than Gaunt and he is the picture of naive idealism. Where Gaunt loves tradition, like classical Greek literature, Elwood loves poetry, specifically Tennyson, and of the poets that he really admires, all of them have very romantic ideals of what the world is, how it operates, what it looks like. And he, like, that is the lens that Ellie sees the world through. He loves the beauty of it. Sidney is also Jewish, but this really doesn't come up very often because he has quite intentionally minimized that part of himself and tried to hide it from his peers and others that he meets throughout the course of the book. We watch these two characters and how they grow and change and evolve throughout the four years of the war, the ways in which they are irrevocably changed by the horrors that they encounter and endure. So the title of the book, In Memoriam, gets its name in reference to all of these little newspaper clippings that we are given at different points throughout the book, which are meant to be clippings of the boarding school's magazine slash newspaper as they shift away from their normal regular publications as the war goes on to almost exclusively publishing ca lists of casualties, deaths, and obituaries for previous students and alumni. And the author was actually inspired to write the book after finding this exact thing in the archives of her own English boarding school. I think it's really interesting how over the course of the book, our relationship as readers to the Prosciutian newspaper changes over time. It's actually the very first thing that you read in the book. An issue of the Prosciutian comes before the first chapter. And so when you're reading it, you're reading it thoroughly. There is some unrelated articles. The war has just began, so there's only a couple of boys that are included in it, and it's still relatively lighthearted. But as we progress further in the book, the way that we read it follows more similarly that of how people at the time would have been reading it, which is skipping through the nonsense, nonsense and quickly scanning the list of names, looking for the people that we recognize, looking for the people that we're dreading to find. Some of the obituaries are really difficult to read because we know and care about the character it's referring to, but honestly, even the obituaries that are included of people that we never met who are completely unrelated can be really difficult to stomach. A lot of the obituaries are actually lifted from the real ones that she was reading in her school's newspaper. So knowing that a lot of these stories are real and very much were written about real boys, not men, boys, who were killed so senselessly in war, it, it's really heartbreaking. <laughs> the story itself is told asynchronously, um, oscillating pretty smoothly between present, uh, past memory, as well as letters between both our main characters and side characters that we encounter. I personally felt like the characters were incredibly three-dimensional and well-rounded. At no point do they feel static. They're constantly changing in their understanding, their viewpoints, their ideologies, their philosophies. There is no point in the book where our two main leads, their beliefs actually intersect or overlap. They are constantly changing and weaving through each other's ideas. You know, where Elwood ends up midway through the book is very similar to where Gaunt was at the beginning, but Gaunt is no longer like he was at the beginning. So 
it's it's very much like this well-woven web of changing ideas and you can see the things that they've gotten from each other and the things that they've let go. With that, I was very, very surprised when I was reading other people's reviews after the fact and of the people who were rating it low, which by the way, is a very small percentage. This book has a whopping 4.54 on Goodreads out of almost 25,000 ratings, like very few of them were rated low. But I saw this come up quite a bit in the low ratings that other people felt like the characters were flat. I just really don't understand how people got to that conclusion. I could see that criticism for some of the side characters because there very much is this revolving door of acquaintances that come in and out. They tend to be pretty one-dimensional, but they also don't live very long. <laughs> like, again, uh, do you see all that black? And I feel like the fact that they are so flat almost adds to the effect of like just how numb our main characters become to the idea of all of these people will be dead and I probably will be too. Despite the fact that this book very much is a romance, first and foremost, it is a romance genre book. That is what drives the plot forward. I really appreciate the fact that the author did not at any point shy away from just how graphic and horrific the brutality of war really is. I would say if you're squeamish about depictions of gore and body horror, maybe this isn't the book for you. I think that added to it, not because I want to see stuff like that or read about it. Honestly, I am very squeamish, but I think it worked really well in this book because that's the point. I, I just think it's really impressive that the author was truly able to make such a well-rounded book. It is a romance book. There is a yearning. There is beautiful yearning. I People could take some notes to do more yearning like Atlas Wynn. There's horrible, horrible things that happen, and yet there's also parts that are laugh out loud funny, that are genuinely joyful, and oftentimes this is happening on the same page. The storytelling is all about the journey of these two characters, not about the overarching plot of the war. You know, we can all read history books, but I think it's much more important to know how these affected individual people. That's where the real stories are. So despite the fact that this is a five-star read for me, I do want to offer a couple of my critiques. So number one, I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing. In fact, it doesn't bother me, but I saw it come up in other people's reviews, so I do want to address it. It can be a little bit predictable, but in kind of unpredictable ways. So at any given point, I think if you have read enough books, you could, you have a pretty good idea of where the story is going to go. But then you'll get a plot twist that you were not expecting. And then you can pretty easily shift course though, because you, you know where it's going now, now that the plot twist has been revealed. And this happens a few times. Again, it really doesn't bother me because I don't think suspense is a necessary part of the genre. The focus is really on our character's journey and their changing beliefs. Plus, these story beats are poetic and, the, and that's like the context under which our main characters view the world and their lives. So I think it very much fits with the fact that this is a character study. And like, I don't know, I feel like a lot of people were also saying, oh, it's so unrealistic. Guys, we need to let go of the idea that fiction needs to always be realistic. It's fiction for a reason. Stories are stories for a reason. If you want things to be realistic, uh, neither of our main characters would have survived. So we wouldn't even have a book. <laughs> I do think that part three, the very end of it, is a little bit rushed. I think it could have benefited from an extra five to ten pages just to give us a better idea of where our characters are at at this point in their life because there is a pretty significant time skip of about two years. I feel like we just don't get quite enough time to fully see where they've come in between where we last left them, but I don't know. I still... <laughs> It's a great book. There is one criticism though that I saw a bunch of other people complaining about that I simply will not accept as valid critique. And that is just how many of the people who rated this book low weren't doing it because they didn't think the book was good. They were doing it specifically, they were admitting to this in their own words, that they didn't like how much of the book drew on other stories. As in like the first-hand accounts that were published that she was drawing details and anecdotes from to include in her book. 
at the, at the end of the book, she cites every single one of these things very thoroughly, by the way. And then if you go on her website, it's even more thorough. Because thorough. in the book, she just says, this part I drew from this book, this part I drew from this book. On her website, she even goes into the why of every single one of those things. So all of these people are like giving bad reviews because they're like, Ellie is literally just Sassoon, like repackaged. Like this character is literally just the real life person, like wartime poet Sassoon. Yes, she knows that. That was the point. <laughs> all of these people are getting upset over plagiarism. Guys, this is historical fiction. If you are reading or writing historical fiction, you should, you should be pulling from first-hand accounts. She found these stories important. She wants to bring them to a larger audience because also in her acknowledgments, she men mentions the fact that I completely agree with that we as Americans don't necessarily get as much interaction with World War I as we do with World War II because we didn't enter World War I until basically the end. But the fact is, all of these books are now a hundred years old, okay? And it, the 21st century audience, the vast majority of us probably aren't going back to read long out of print accounts of World War I. Taking these stories and incorporating them into her novel, not plagiarizing, incorporating them into her novel is bringing these very important stories to a wider audience. And I'm sorry if that's why you didn't like the book because she's plagiarizing. You're just wrong. <laughs> you are just wrong. At no point is she trying to say, this is, I came up with it. I invented it. No, no, no. She didn't. And that's the point. Okay, rant over. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna talk about 1917, the movie, a little bit now. Still no spoilers. I'll let you know when there's spoilers, okay? Again, I saw this three or four times when it was in theaters. I watched it again last night, cried like a little baby. If you don't know the movie that I'm talking about, 1917 came out in 2019, and you might remember it for the kind of gimmick <laughs> that it is. Number one, it takes place over just 24 hours following two men. The gimmick part is that it was filmed very intentionally to look like a single continuous shot. At no point in this movie is there stillness, okay? They are constantly moving, constantly going forward. From the very beginning, I felt this movie should be told in real time. Every step of the journey, breathing every breath with these men felt integral. And there is no better way to tell this story than with one continuous shot. And there was critique when this movie came out, that it is just kind of gimmicky because the cinematography is like, that was like the big draw of the movie. Here's my opinion on that. I love a gimmick if they deliver. And my God, did they deliver. This movie is beautiful. It is a gorgeous piece of art, okay? The sets are insane. The acting was incredible. The takes that they're doing, yes, there are obviously real cuts <laughs> that they had to weave together, but many of the takes are like 10 plus minutes. The opening scene is a nine minute continuous take. That's theater. <laughs> that, that is literally theater. I'll, I'll insert a clip here. Sometimes you have a camera being carried by an operator hooked onto a wire. The wire carries it across small land and it's unhooked again. That operator runs with it, then steps onto a small Jeep, which carries him another 400 yards. He steps off it again and goes around the corner. There's always that sort of get out of jail card that you have for the movie. Well, you know, we might be able to cut around this or we might take that scene out. That's not possible on this film. The dance of the camera and the mechanics all have to be in sync with what the actors do. It's like a piece of theatre every take. Once he starts, it can't stop. If something goes wrong, you just have to keep going. And there were so many scenes that I just completely got lost in. I'm sorry! Welcome to the Order from the general. Sometimes a scene was six minutes long, and when they caught cut, I would completely forget who I was. Also, that movie absolutely stunning performance by George Mackay. The fact that he wasn't nominated for an Oscar for that is actually crazy to me. So just like the book, 1917, the movie follows two men on a personal journey during the war. Um, although the book covers a span of four years, the movie actually only covers the span of a single 24-hour day as these two boys, really, uh, have to go ac go across 
occupied territory in order to deliver a message to stop an attack that is going to save the lives of 1600 men. Both stories follow these two men, one of whom is a realist who is hardened by circumstances outside but incredibly sensitive and caring on the inside, and the other man is a young idealist who believes that there is purpose still to the suffering, that there is something honorable about it, and who so far feels immune to it. Blake is young and optimistic and has a bright future ahead of him, whereas Schofield is older and he has lived to see more and we learn that he is actually a person who survived the psalm which is also relevant to the book but more on that later okay at this point if you haven't haven't read the book you don't want to hear spoilers you haven't watched the movie you don't want to hear spoilers now is your time shut this off go watch the movie go read the book please come back and talk about it with me after your life has been changed so I want to talk about the way these two stories intertwine first, because again, I was a bit struck by some of the narrative similarities. Both pieces of media employ a very similar bait and switch, where you begin thinking that one of these men is your main character, and you're going to follow him, and that's going to be the person who drives the story, only for their perspective to be quite suddenly cut off by unfortunate circumstance and death. Again, Blake carries this kindness and optimism and naivety that leads him to want to rescue a German soldier who would otherwise die in a plane crash. Schofield is very much against this. He's like, we should put him out of his misery. It's not likely he'll survive anyway. The man's on fire. Um, but Blake insists, no, get him water. He needs water. And as Blake is trying to help him and Schofield is going to get water, the German stabs Blake. And there is a really really heartbreaking like 10 minute scene of Blake dying and Schofield really just having to be there for him. It's honestly so difficult to watch. Am I dying? Yes. Yes, I think you are. Will you write to my mum for me? I will. Tell her I wasn't scared. Anything else? I love them. Tell me you know the way. I know the way. I'm going to head southeast until I hit a coast. I'll pass through the town and out to the east, all the way to Quasiel Wood. It'll be dark by then. That won't bother me. I'll find the second. I'll give them the message. And then I'll find your brother. Just like you. A little older. And similarly, in In Memoriam, while you know kind of from the beginning that you are going to be switching between Gaunt and Ellie's point of views, it still feels like Gaunt is really our main, main character. Until there is an untimely death. But, 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 this is not a kill your gay story, okay? This is a romance genre, so he does not stay dead, thank goodness. Both Schofield and Gaunt in the movie as this event happens, it's really what launches them on this Odyssean journey that they have to complete in order to, you know, complete their mission, return home, get back to the people who need them. Why did I send you on your own? They didn't. There were two of us. To know it's down to you. Yes. You'll never make it. Yes, I will. So again, I highly recommend you watch Lady Night the Brave's In Memoriam video essay if you haven't seen it and you like the movie or you're interested in the movie. It is a really, really thorough and beautiful video essay talking about so much more of that movie that I'm going to. Um, but there is a section where she specifically goes into the history of various Sikh 
people who were in the British army. There is a character in the movie who seek and helps Schofield in a moment of desperation, getting the other men to help as well. Back in! Get back in! Go! Is all right? Dear driver, how about you try to keep it on the bloody road for a change? I'll piss off. But there's also an Indian character. It, I don't know if it's specified that Gideon Davy is Sikh or not, but he is Indian and one of Gaunt's close childhood friends that he ends up coming into contact with again throughout his journey. Um, so I think it's interesting and good that both pieces of media chose to incorporate at least partially the stories of a group of people who were instrumental to the army's success, who were very important players in the war, and yet are not often acknowledged or appreciated in history books. And then another interesting parallel is both Ellie and Schofield survived the Somme. Schofield is, it's obviously happening before because the Somme took place in 1916, 1917 is when this is set, um, but Ellie survives the Somme much later into the book because, again, we're starting in 1914. Both of them survive, both of them earn medals from it, and neither of them care about it one bit. I swapped it with a French captain. You swapped it? Mm -hmm. For what? A bottle of wine. What did you do that for? I was thirsty. Men have died for that. If I got a medal, I'd take it back home. Why didn't you just take it home? Look, it's just a bit of bloody tin. It doesn't make you special. It doesn't make any difference to anyone. Yes, it does. And it's not just a bit of tin. It's got a ribbon on it. So the places where these two stories diverge is primarily over class differences. So 1917 is more so the experience of war from a lower rank without the protection of money and connections. These are enlisted and conscripted men. The filmmakers actually make this really incredible choice to have all of the, like, every man played by less known actors, whereas the higher ranking officials, the higher up in rank you go, the more high profile the actor who plays them. So we have people like Colin Firth and Benedict Cumberbatch playing very, very high ranking officers. We have um, uh, Andrew, what's his name? The hot priest. Hold on. <laughs> we have Andrew Scott playing more of like a middle level <laughs> ranking officer. And again, all of the soldiers that we meet along the way are just nobodies. And I think this was a really smart choice for the filmmakers to do because it's a great allegory for the ways that only men of upper rank in class are the ones whose names are known. They're the ones whose stories most often get told. Unlike 1917, In Memoriam is the experience of war from a higher rank. Again, these are private school boys. There is a lot of running into people that they know throughout this book, which again, some of the negative reviewers said that this was a little too coincidental, but it actually wouldn't have been that uncommon. There are about 20 main boarding schools that all of these boys went to, and when they joined the army, they weren't jo joining as enlisted men. Because of their education, they were very quickly put into officer ranks. There's one character, Hayes, who is our consistent look into the lower class experience. Despite his experience and skill as a commanding officer, he continually gets passed up for promotions. It's extra insulting when Ellie is thought to be dead for a couple days. He was fine. He just, <laughs> there was a mix up. Um, and when he comes back, he's surprised to find that there has been a new commanding officer shipped in, a stranger to all of these men, to take over in Ellie's place instead of just promoting Hayes, who's been there before Gaunt got there. Many of the Pursuit kids die over the course of this book, but they still have the space to name all of their names and obituaries in the Pursuitian newspaper. This isn't the case for the everyman. How do you fit 60,000 names of casualties in the newspaper and also think that we can have space for obituaries? You simply don't. In fact, later in the book, Gaunt actually thinks about these types of privileges as he's arranging passage. He pulls some strings to get connections so that him and somebody, we'll talk about it later. Um, but he's thinking about the fact that if Hayes had been in his exact position, 
he wouldn't have gotten the luxury of being able to get out of it in the way that Gaunt did simply because of the people that he knows. Also, these two pieces of media take very different perspectives towards where they want to leave the ending. Although I still think the ending was a little bit rushed, it's very clear that our boys are getting a happy ending despite maybe how unrealistic that might be, they are no longer in danger from the war. So they, they do have to go train new recruits, but they're not going to be put in the front again. Ellie suffers a pretty life-altering injury at the Somme, and uh, later in the book when people are visiting him as he's recovering, there's one in, man in particular who was also there who got out of it completely unscathed, and Ellie incorrectly assumes that his attitude towards Ellie is one of disgust and, like, looking down on him. It, that's actually not the case. The man is acting weird around him because he's jealous. Not because he wants to have such a life-altering injury, but he's jealous because despite having lived through the exact same horrible, horribly violent battle that Ellie did, he's getting sent back to the front line. So Schofield also survived the Somme just like Ellie. He also won a medal for bravery after saving people's lives. The movie only covers 24 hours in April of 1917 and so when you get to the end of it and Schofield finally gets a moment to take a breath and sit and contemplate the fact that he's lived another day and maybe one day he'll have the luxury of going back home to his family, there's still another year and a half of war that he has to survive before that's going to be possible. So I wanna get into a more in-depth character analysis now. The way that this is gonna work is we're going to look at each of our two leads through the lens of the self-proclaimed inspiration and the things that they draw meaning from. So for Gaunt, this is the Greek classics, specifically Thucydides, and for Ellie, this is the romantic poets, specifically Tennyson. Gaunt has always had a much more well-rounded and realistic view of the world. He's fluent not just in two languages, but in two different cultures and points of view. He has a much wider understanding of the world as a whole than Ellie does from his relatively sheltered life just in England. And I'll talk about that more when we're in Ellie's section for specifics, but Gaunt feels more connected to the ideals of the Greeks because they follow more of his own internal view of the world, which is more of a realistic view of life and the highs and lows that it may bring. Everybody wins and everybody loses. On page 329, he says, the library at Thornycraft was well stocked with novels and poetry, but it was the classics that Gaunt wanted. Plutarch and Xenophon and Thucydides, men who proved that Gaunt's own troubles were ancient and survivable. They were clear-eyed, the Greeks. They did not dress up the world with romance and chivalry, did not lure the poetry-hearted fools into evil. Throughout the book, Gaunt talks a lot about Thucydides, the one who resonates with him the most. So as a historical figure, Thucydides is considered at least in the Western world, the first true historian. He valued eyewitness testimonies in a way that people really hadn't before and quite notably didn't include the gods as figures through which to interpret such events. He was facts based. <laughs> Not much is known about Thucydides' personal history, but of the few details that we do know and can confirm, Gaunt and Thucydides have a pretty similar arc. Just like Gaunt, Thucydides was caught between two cultures and two ideologies in his war. Both of them found the culture that they loved and felt belonging to is not the one that they agreed with morally. Gaunt very much feels German. He loves the Germans, he cares about the Germans, but he still wants the English to win because he doesn't agree with the German cause in the war that they're fighting. Also, like Gaunt, Thucydides fought in his war until he could no longer fight, where Gaunt suffers injury, uh, Thucydides gets the plague, <laughs> but, but then they were exiled over something that they really had no control over. So Thucydides is representative of Gaunt's ideology, but his journey follows that of Odysseus. Gaunt enters the army pretty quickly into the book, like within the, I think the end of the first chapter is him signing up and enlisting. Um, and it isn't until midway through the book that Ellie joins him. Again, Ellie is a year younger, although he does sign up also before he's of age, they both do. So after Gaunt had gone to the front and before Ellie comes, they've been sending letters to each other where Gaunt is talking about the horrors of war. And Ellie is responding with like, silly little boarding school drama that's happening. One of these things is pretty sad. A guy 
is mad at Ellie and ends up burning all of his poems, which is a grudge that Ellie simply can't forgive. And I don't think he should be expected to. But after Ellie and Gaunt are now both on the front lines, and that man, whose name is Burgonia? I think it's Burgoyne? Okay, after Burgoyne shows up, even when he's sitting in it, he's still excited about the war. It hasn't had a chance to really get him yet. The two of them are quickly drawn back into this schoolboy rivalry, and Ellie's behavior towards him, no matter how justifies, elicits a petty response. Gaunt can immediately see the situation for what it is, which is this petty school drama quickly turning into a life-or-death mission in which death is the more likely outcome. Ellie and Burgoyne still don't see just how real that is. Burgoyne doesn't realize the extent of his own power, just how much danger he's putting these men into for no reason. So the two men are arguing. Gaunt is also there to witness this. Page 140. Enough, shouted Burgoyne. I am your superior, Elwood. Elwood pushed past Gaunt and struck Burgoyne hard across the face. You're a shameful coward. Burgoyne was pale, except for his cheek, which was scarlet. His nostrils flared. Striking a superior is punishable by death, he said. Burgoyne, said Gaunt, his voice cracking. Burgoyne turned to look at him with sudden sharpness of a snake about to strike. Gaunt sank onto an ammunition case. Elwood laughed, bright-eyed. Someone had to tell him, Gaunt. In this war, he's a god, Elwood. He put his face into his hands. You've, got, you've brought the anger of the gods upon us. So as for the mission itself, 141, they want more information on the German troops. You and I are to take three men and capture a German prisoner. There was an awful pause. When? asked Taze. Tonight. But that's impossible. Elwood and I have enemies in high places, said Gaunt with a small laugh. They go on the mission and surprise, surprise, men die, including, they believe, Gaunt. So he actually gets shot in the chest in the German trench, grabbing one of the soldiers to bring as prisoner. And I mean, every, he, it, he, he was shot in the chest, okay? Every, it's safe to assume that he's dead. Of course, this is romance. This is romance, okay? So he isn't, but they don't know that. The irony here is that neither Ellie nor Burgoyne fully understand the power that they wield in this dynamic. This new officer genuinely thinks that Ellie is joking when he comes back and informs him that Gaunt is dead from this useless mission that they sent him on to teach Ellie a lesson. Gaunt is dead. And this is their exchange from that. It's on page 154. Is Gaunt really dead? Yes. You aren't... You aren't playing a prank? Elwood leaned heavily against the banister, numb with hopelessness. A prank, Burgoyne? Yes, to give me a scare. Elwood was hit by a dizzying wave of nostalgia for Preshoot, for ripping up studies and playing cricket and lounging in beech trees, eating scrummed apples. No, it's not a prank, Burgoyne. Burgoyne looked utterly astonished. What did you expect? asked Elwood, gently, curiously. He was too weary to hate Burgoyne just then. Hate would come later. It would make him strong and brittle and warped, a brave and furious soldier, but it had not come yet. I thought you'd get a bit of a fright and, and see that you couldn't treat me that way, said Burgoyne. A bit of a fright, Elwood said blankly. Burgoyne nodded. He looked eerily green and corpse light in the dim hall lighting. Elwood started to descend the stairs. Elwood, said Burgoyne. Elwood did not stop. He did not care what Burgoyne had to say. It could not matter. Nothing could. It was also blindingly meaningless. His buttons weren't polished. The regiment they would slaughter tomorrow came from Munich, where the girls wore drindles and they ate white sausage for breakfast. Elwood, wait, how? Elwood trod heavily down the stairs, so tired. He was shot in the chest, he said, without looking around. We had to, we had to leave him behind. He almost reached the door when Burgoyne spoke again. Elwood, I, what can I do? Elwood stopped and faced him nothing. This time, Burgoyne did not follow when he walked away. But anyways, uh, back to Gaunt, because <laughs> this is his section. What Elwood thinks, and everybody else thinks, is Gaunt's death is actually just the beginning of his journey. Gaunt is German. When he was actually climbing into the trench to grab the prisoner, he thought he saw his cousin Ernst and called out for him as he was shot. The kid was not Ernst, but he felt so guilty, and the guy looked him in the eye and spoke in perfect German that 
they actually took care of him. So in a way, the German trench actually becomes Gaunt's very own Ogigia, where the people treat him kindly and do their best to nurse him back to health. He is German in every way to them, except for his uniform. And it isn't until a new commander comes in weeks and weeks later, noticing the uniform, that he's actually sent off to a real prisoner of war camp. Luckily, by that point, his injury is manageable. He still can hardly walk. He still can't really do much, but it's manageable. So at the prisoner of war camp, he... Gaunt really does find community. Again, a lot of the boys that he went to school with, they're all becoming commanding officers. So he actually knows a few of the people that he ends up in the prisoner of war camp with, including his childhood friend, his Indian friend, Gideon Davy, as well as another guy named uh, Pritchard. Archie Pritchard, page 211, it says, I heard there was some injured giant in here shouting every time somebody came in, so I had to investigate. I'm in this dorm, you know. It, it'll be like Grinstead House all over again. Davy smirked. More than you know, it's astonishing how well English boarding school prepares one for prison. There's a fellow in here who says he wishes his parents had sent him here instead of Preshute, calls Preshute a house of tortures. I can't tell you how glad I am to see you, said Gaunt. I've been going mad inside my head. This entire section is actually surprisingly delightful and it points laugh out loud funny. I'm actually, I'm gonna read you just a little piece. This is from page 229. Right, Gaunt, you'll have to play Hector, said McCorkendale. You said I could play Hector, complained Nicholson. That was before I found out Gaunt was a classicist. Hector has the most lines after Achilles. Can I play Achilles? McCorkendale cast Nicholson a withering look. I'm Achilles. <laughs> I don't really want to play Hector, said Gaunt. I don't know the Iliad nearly as well as you th think I do, McCorkendale. We can do the Peloponnesian War another time, Gaunt. For the moment, by popular demand, it's the Iliad, and you have to play Hector. You speak Greek better than the others. Nicholson groaned. Oh, we're not doing it in Greek, are we? <laughs> They're literally putting on a little play. Um, the hijinks at the prisoner of war camp are really funny. They are constantly trying to devise new plans to sneak out. Uh, it's the English, there's French, there's Russian soldiers, and there's a surprising amount of camaraderie where other, <laughs> other prisoners are more than happy to help people with their escape plans, and everybody just kind of takes turns making plans. Um, and there's an ongoing joke, the French are always down to cause the distraction. So none up to that point have been successful. Um, Davy has been working on one, but the last piece that they need in order to make their attempt is papers. There are one or two avenues for pr potentially getting these, and they don't think any of them are going to be successful, particularly because the commander's secretary, who is one of those avenues, uh, is an ice queen. And Gaunt is like, no, she's not. She's really nice to me. And they're like, oh. And Gaunt's like, oh. So Gaunt, over the course of a few months, romances the secretary, Elizabeth, and they go on dates. Also, by the way, as a side note, uh, the prisoners can like leave camp. I know that sounds crazy, but they just, they give you your word that you're not going to run away and you can like take walks beyond the borders and stuff like that. So Elizabeth and Gaunt start going on dates and they actually do hook up a few times. Gaunt and Elizabeth have a relationship, and at points, Gaunt considers just how easy it would be to marry her and stay in Germany forever. He doesn't feel anything for Elizabeth sexually, but he genuinely, over time, begins to care for her as a friend. He does, at one point, accidentally call her Ellie as they're hooking up, and she's like, say it again, that's what my mother calls me, and he's like, I can't. I can't do that. In the end, just like Cersei, Elizabeth provides the men with aid and provisions for their journey, despite the fact that she's sad to lose Gaunt. Though there are some hiccups and a temporary setback, um, the plan that they had doesn't go through, but it's okay because Davy has a backup planned. They do eventually get out and make their escape, and as they're on the run throughout Germany, um, they encounter various obstacles that they narrowly escaped, a la the Odyssey. Um, at one point, Davy is lost, which is a shame, but in the end, Gaunt and Pritchard do end up making it to the Netherlands, which means they are on their way to freedom. This is from page 285. They approached a small stone cottage with candles lit in the windows and knocked. A man in nightclothes opened the door. He eyed them with a great suspicion. Given how wild Gaunt and Pritchard looked at this point, he couldn't blame him. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. 
Is this Overdinkel? asked Gaunt in German. Ja voil? We're in the Netherlands? Ja voils? repeated the man. Gaunt could not stop the joy and relief from spilling out into laughter. Next to him, Pritchard made an uncharacteristic giggling sound. The Dutchman stared at them as if they were mad. So this man and his wife end up feeding them and housing them for the night. But they're like, in the morning, we're going to have to take you to the holding center, though. Like, they're gonna, you're going to have to show your papers and everything. They're like, mm, no, we don't need to do that. They're like, no, we have to. And so finally, they agree to do this. But through that, there's this funny bit where they're basically just, can I speak to your manager themselves all the way up to the highest command and are able to... Uh, make arrangements for travel to Amsterdam, where they're going to be helped by Mr. Rosevier, who's the father of three of their classmates, one of whom is Ellie's friend at this point in time. Um, and just like the Phoenicians, Mr. Rosevier listens to them recount their story and marvels over all of the adversity that they faced. He also uses his own resources to ensure a safe end to their journey. Gaunt's storyline is literally the Odyssey. It's literally the Odyssey. Now let's talk about Ellie. Just as Gaunt loves Thucydides and quotes him regularly in order to kind of support him on his own journey to feel less alone, Ellie loves Tennyson and quotes him as well as other romantic poets regularly. Gaunt stays silent when he can't find the right words to speak, whereas Ellie just uses the words of the poets, who he feels can say it better than he could anyways. Very early on in the book, we see that lens that Ellie carries, where he chooses to embrace all of the beauty that the world has to offer. He wants to fill his senses so deeply that he can block out any of the ugliness. Whereas Gaunt notes to himself that while he prefers beauty, he wants to see the world through Ellie's eyes, he feels that the ugliness of life is too important to be ignored. From the beginning, Ellie has a soft spot for Tennyson's poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, which was a dramatic tribute to the cavalrymen lost after an ill-advised strategic push during the Crimean War. He quotes it often and views the idea of war through its lens. It's sad that people are dying, but they're dying with honor, with valor, and their deaths mean something for their country. Where Ellie idolizes the gallantry of the soldiers, Gaunt remains critical and wary of the blind patriotism that the poem invokes. Ellie's idea of this would eventually change when he himself becomes the victim of an even worse, arguably the worst ever, ill-advised strategic push at the Somme. He sees war as a just and honorable thing to be a part of. And in a letter to Gaunt on page 32, he says... Do you suppose the Romantic poets would have had anything to write about if it hadn't been for the Napoleonic Wars? I can't tell you how glad I am to be alive and young when we are. A war is what is needed, an injection of passion into a century of peace. It will galvanize us into a 20th century renaissance, says Master Larchmont, and he would know. I've enclosed a poem I had published in the Prosciutian. It's rousing stuff about a brave young second lieutenant storming into the German wire. It's not my best, though. I can't wait to join you, Gonto not just because I want fodder for my art. So very early on within the book, I think within the first few pages, Gaunt and Ellie are talking about how terrible it would be for them to have bad in memoriams written for them and published in their paper. Later in the book, Gaunt muses over whether Ellie would write an in memoriam for him. And Ellie says that he would, along with a poem that he would title In Memoriam HMG, in reference to Tennyson's In Memoriam AHH. When Tennyson's best friend Arthur Hallam died unexpectedly from a cerebral hemorrhage, that grief actually prompted Tennyson to begin writing again. He had stopped for a while after having received poor critical reception of his most recent publication. I think it's really interesting that Ellie does view Tennyson's work through such a lens of romanticism, considering that the bulk of it was connected with a through line of grief and ultimately loss. So we have to talk about the psalm because where Gaunt's experience with the prisoner of war camp is his arc, um, I would argue that the majority of Ellie's character growth comes from his experience leading up to and in the Battle of Somme. So if you don't know what the Battle of the Somme is, it took place from July 1st to November 18th of 1916. In the first day alone, the British Army had over 57,000 casualties, including 19,000 deaths. 
And by the time the battle would be over in November, the British army would have over 420,000 casualties and 95,000 deaths. Over the course of the four years of fighting from 1914 to 1918, the Brits lost 6% of their entire male adult population, which is a little less than 3% of the entire population. When we're talking about that scale of meaningless and useless death and destruction, it would feel really weird for me not to at least acknowledge what's happening right now in our world of a similar scale. So in Gaza, since October, over 35,000 people have been killed, most of them civilians and at least 13,000 of them children. Gaza has a population of only 2.3 million, which means in just six, seven months, 1.5% of their entire population has, has been killed. Again, most of them civilians. Of those who have survived, over 80% of the entire population has been displaced from their homes, and over 50% of them are in extreme famine, with those numbers expected to rise as critical aid drop points are being blockaded by new attacks. We just like signed into law a $26 billion aid package to go to that general area. Of that $26 billion, only $9 billion of it is for actual humanitarian aid. Specifically, $4 billion of it is allocated to buy more bombs. I don't know about you, I am not okay with my tax dollar money being used to bomb anybody at all, anywhere, let alone women, children, civilians. This is an inexcusable and entirely preventable humanitarian crisis. If you live in the United States, I am begging you to contact your representatives as many times as you need to and demand that they call for a ceasefire immediately. I'm going to link to a few different things in the description, including Operation Olive Branch, which is a really wonderful resource that updates regularly as new information becomes available. Right now, they're working on this wonderful project called Pass the Hat, which matches up individual families who are looking for aid in order to fund their evacuation with influencers who are able to use their platform to garner donations. I have not personally adopted one of these families because I don't feel like I have the platform reach in order to get them what they need. But if you follow me on TikTok, I've been reposting any of them that I see. I've donated to quite a few. There have even been a couple of times where I went to donate only to see that their goal had already been met, which is such a wonderful thing. So even if you don't have a dollar to spare, you can repost, you can share the word, you can bother your representatives and demand that they call for a ceasefire. But back to the story. We're at the Somme. The Battle of the Somme is actually the only time that we get a true POV switch outside of either of our main characters. Instead of Gaunt or Ellie, we get the point of view of Gaunt's cousin, Ernst. It's a really haunting passage as he describes the horror of watching thousands upon th thousands of human beings march so readily and relentlessly to certain death. There was no comparison. No animal on earth would have suffered it. No creature would walk so knowingly, so hopelessly, into the jaws of death. His lips moved in prayer. Tears stained his face. When will they stop? Surely some general, even now, was telephoning the front line, saying, Call it off. It's a massacre. Nothing will be gained. Perhaps we can save a battalion or two. He had no idea how long he had been at the gun, how many men he had killed. Soldiers had started to find gaps in the German wire. The machine gunners picked them off leisurely at the bottlenecks. They fell on the bodies of those who had gone before, and the men behind them stepped on their corpses before being killed themselves. Ernst couldn't think of them as humans. Humans did not die like that, in droves. They began to seem like ants to him, and he was a child crushing them with his fingers. It was the only way he could continue to load the ammunition, now that he could see their glazed, terrified faces. Ellie has met Ernst before. He went on a trip with Gaunt and his family to Berlin a couple summers ago. They spent the whole time together. Of all surprises, Ellie jumps into the trench right next to him. Ellie tells Ernst, I won't surrender, you'll have to kill me. And before Ernst even has a chance to respond, his jaw is shot off by Rosevere, who is coming to Ellie's aid thinking that he's in danger. I mean, he is, but not for the reasons that he thinks. They have an exchange between the two of them where they realize all of their men are dead already. 
But as long as he's still breathing, Ellie refuses to give up orders, which I interpret as the need to justify this insane strategy and the desperation to convince himself that it has been worth it, even knowing that it hasn't. The violence is so horrible that Ellie begins to mentally separate it from it, his mind's way of protecting him. Not really knowing what else to do, since he's already made it to the German line, Ellie starts to bring surviving men back into the trench for medical treatment. He manages to bring six men back to safety, including another Prussian boy who's in his unit and is pissed that Ellie's not just letting him die. During one of the rescues, Ellie mentally notes that the Germans don't shoot at him as soon as he starts to retreat. They're purposely trying to avoid anybody who's retreating because the slaughter is it's already too much. Unfortunately, on his way to get the last person that he's able to save, Ellie gets hit with some shrapnel and has a life-altering disfigurement where he loses an eye and half of his face. Although he knows that something happened, he doesn't know the full extent of it until after he gets back into the trench and the doctor is like, you need to sit down, uh, you're missing half of your face. So at this point, we also need to talk about Gaunt's sister, Maud. Ellie has always treated Maud as a prospect for marriage, and we learn that this is specifically because he sees it as the only way that he might be able to keep Gaunt in his life forever, or at least a piece of him. This is also a nod to Tennyson, as his best friend, Arthur Hallam, married his sister. Maud herself was named for the Tennyson poem, Maud, where the narrator begins with suffering a loss and then becomes obsessed with the idea of Maud while ultimately determining that she'd make a bad wife. <laughs> Ellie is on leave for the first time after Gaunt's death and they reunite for lunch. It's a very uncomfortable scene. They're both angry and upset and they don't know how to talk to each other. He kind of uh, quite rudely proposes to her in a very like backhanded way and Maud rejects Partly because he was really rude, but also because she's decided that she doesn't really want to marry. She wants to be a politician, and she feels like a husband would take up too much of her time. The final two stanzas of the poem echo not what Ellie feels for Maud, but what he feels for Gaunt. There has fallen a splendid tear from the passion flower at the gate. She is coming, my dove, my dear. She is coming, my life, my fate. The red rose cries, she is near, she is near, and the white rose weeps, she is late. The larkspur listens, I hear, I hear, and the lily whispers, I wait. She is coming, my own, my sweet, were it ever so airy a tread, my heart would hear her and beat, were it earth in an earthy bed, my dust would hear her and beat, had I lain for a century dead, would start and tremble under her feet, and blossom in purple and red. Another theme that comes up a lot throughout the book is the question of whether it's better to have loved and lost or to have never have loved at all, and both Ellie and Gaunt must grapple with this question throughout the story. First with Gaunt through a letter that he receives from another Prashute boy who is also gay and also had a relationship with a different one, um, and then also when with Ellie, when Hayes gives him an unfinished letter that Gaunt started to write the night that they were going to do their mission. He only wrote four words of it, but it says, my dearest darling Sydney. Now, Ellie had mentioned to Hayes that Gaunt never called him by his first name and he never knew why. And this triggers Hayes to think that he should give him the, the letter. It just never occurred to him before. And those four words are enough to make Sydney kind of <laughs> kind of go a little crazy because what did he mean by that he never called me sydney he never my dearest darling did he love me why am i only learning this now is it better to have learned it now i think i might have been happier if i had never known because now what have i missed out on so towards the end of gaunt's time at the prisoner of war camps they're getting pretty close to their escape they get a pretty rare delivery of newspapers and it's in one of these newspapers that gaunt sees ellie's poem Right there on the page is In Memoriam H.W.G. Gaunt sees the poem as being pure Tennyson in meter, but he can recognize Ellie's rage, a piece of him distinct from his hero. Both Gaunt and Ellie have a streak of this rage, but they've always expressed it differently. Gaunt through physical violence and Ellie through his meters. Though Gaunt only recognizes one of the stanzas to be about him specifically, we as readers understand the references for all of the others, and it's pretty heartbreaking to read. 
The one stanza that he does dedicate to Gaunt is as follows. I hear the breaking body scream, thankful I have hit my mark. I slither through the trenching dark, you bleed to death in all my dreams. Seeing Ellie's poem is what spurts Gaunt into more intense action. He realizes that Ellie truly believes that he's dead and there is nothing that's going to stop him from getting back to the boy that he loves. Now that you have a good idea of who Ellie and Gaunt are as people and how their heroes influence their outlook on life, we need to talk about the trauma because my goodness, this book is full of it. It's, it's full of it. And I think it would be a disservice to the war, to the story, to have it be otherwise. The bulk of Gaunt's trauma, or at least the specific instance that spurs on his PTSD dreams, happens before Ellie even enlists. In fact, it's the letter that he writes to Ellie about this experience that makes Ellie realize he has to go. So in this letter, Gaunt is detailing an experience he had where he's trying to get his unit to get out of the trench and go into no man's land in order to escape an impending gas attack. His men are paralyzed by fear and he's so desperate to get them to comply that the only thing that's going to get them to move is to make them more fearful of staying. He fires a warning shot into the sandbags, but he himself is so terrified and shaking so much that he misses and accidentally shoots one of his men in the head. By the end of his letter, you can tell that he is just so defeated by all of the trauma that he's experienced up to that point that he is simply waiting for his own death, knowing that it's inevitable. So the final bit of his letter as he's recounting this experience to Ellie, page 77, I will shoot you all, I screamed, brandishing my pistol. Then, mercifully, they began to stir, and we climbed over the top. I was crying as I ran into machine gun fire. I could not see David on my left, nor Maitland on my right. All of no man's land was beginning to yellow with gas. I plunged forward, and suddenly I realized I was alone. All my men, every last one, had been hit. I stood on the most godforsaken patch of earth I hope ever exists, and I thought, I wonder how Ellie is. Then something knocked painlessly into my leg, and I saw that I had caught a bullet. I couldn't feel it, but I knew I would soon, and the gas was coming. I picked up my nearest injured man and dragged him into the trench before my leg gave way. Maitland was killed, and David was shot in the shoulder, but he's been all but he'll be all right. I've been made captain. Seems a well-tailored uniform and the right accent make me a better candidate than Hayes, despite his years of experience. My leg is healing nicely. Soon I will have to go back. I'm terrified. I wish to God I could see you again before I die. Yours, Gaunt. So Ellie will be the first to say that he always does what Gaunt tells him. And so receiving this letter, the fact that Gaunt wants to see him again before he dies means that Ellie will go to him. And that's what he does. But even though Ellie knows the story, Ellie really isn't expecting when Gaunt gets so triggered by simply the mention of playing the game of cards on page 93. Well, I'm wired, said Huxton, comfortably. He pulled a pack of playing cards out of his rucksack. What do you say a game of cards, Gaunt? Gaunt stared at the cards as if he had seen a ghost, and then, to Elwood's abject horror, he burst into tears. The three men watched him in utter silence as Gaunt howled, an insane animal sound, his eyes wide open as the tears streamed out of them. I missed and shot Harkins in the head, he had written in his letter to Elwood. He'd signed up in 1914 and never been injured. No one would play him at cards because he always won. When he's helping with the escape plan at the prisoner of war camp, they are digging a tunnel underground, long story. But as he's digging, he has a full-blown panic attack when he thinks he smells the gas. He's not able to control the way that his body reacts. He also has recurring nightmares of this experience with Harkins. Throughout the book, the characters are mostly pretty kind and understanding about these recurring dreams and the way that he shouts and screams in them. Of course, with people that he's maybe on less good terms with, this does cause some resentment, but everybody is pretty used to everybody else being kind of fucked up, and for the most part, they're pretty understanding. As Gaunt and Pritchard are in the hotel in Amsterdam after escaping Germany, and as they're about to make their way back to England, um, <laughs> Gaunt wakes up in the middle of the night and apologizes to Archie. So, page 300. For the love of God, Henry. I'm sorry, gasped Gaunt. I'm sorry. The sheets were wet with sweat. Pritchard lit two cigarettes, passing one to Gaunt. Thanks, said Gaunt. I'm awfully sorry. I'll stay up for a bit so you can sleep. 
It's no use. I'm just out here keeping watch on the fucking fire escape. They smoke their cigarettes in silence. It'll be better when we're back at the front, Gaunt said eventually. What will we do when the war ends? Never sleep again? Gaunt laughed, as if the war will end. Let's take a walk, he said. If I have to shoot Harkins in my dreams one more time, I don't know what I'll do. So later in that chapter, Pritchard kind of pries a little bit more to be like, hey, what actually happened? Like, I've kind of pieced it together, but I don't know the details. And when Gaunt tells him, Pritchard says, well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that happened. It's always really hard shooting your own countrymen. And Gaunt says, yeah, the problem is that I've been shooting my countrymen the whole time. The part where he gets captured is actually um, Bavarians, and his mother is Bavarian. While Ellie is very understanding about the dreams and he's able to comfort Gaunt uh, during their time together when he has those, he can't fully wrap his head around the waking nightmare that countless soldiers around him who are losing their nerve experience, including the psychosomatic loss of bodily function. He determines it to be cowardice, but Hayes tells him that it happens to everyone eventually. Before they went on their mission that led to Gaunt's death, he had told Hayes that if Ellie survives to please take care of him, and Hayes has held true to this. They develop what I would consider to be a pretty sweet friendship overall, although Hayes remains at least a little bit distant from Ellie because of the class difference, despite the fact that Ellie really does see them on equal levels and he respects Hayes, but Hayes keeps a bit of distance between them because he doesn't know how much Ellie respects him and assumes that Ellie looks down on him because of his class in a similar way that Hayes at least a little bit looks down on Ellie because of his. But when Hayes does start losing his nerve, um, Ellie really doesn't know how to deal with this because up till that point he's been able to excuse all of those symptoms of other people as just being cowardice but he knows Hayes and he knows how brave he is so he's not able to just kind of push this away as easily. On page 172 they discuss this a little bit. Carrington's just trying to get sent home said Elwood while Carrington was on patrol. Hayes lit a cigarette with trembling hands. That's waiting for all of us if we survive he said madness. Hayes refused to be alone with Carrington. He walked up and down the trenches while Elwood was on duty and only slept when Carrington was out. Nonsense, said Elwood. You're passing your prime, Elwood. After six months, your nerves start to go. We'll see. Elwood drummed his fingers on the table. Is that what you fear most? Shell shock? It was a common conversation. In 1913, you might ask new acquaintances where he had gone to school or what he did for a living. In 1916, it was this. What part of yourself do you most fear losing? Hayes gave a small shrug. If you get your legs blown off, you're still you. When this conversation kind of repeats later down the line as Hayes slips further and further into his trauma, he even goes so far to say that he's glad Henry was killed because he would much rather him be dead than lose himself to such madness. It's the psalm that really breaks Ellie, which is to be expected. Though he has survived physically, he has an unquenchable anger and impatience towards anyone who hasn't been in the trenches. Everything else is stupid and trivial and pointless, and he feels dirty being away from it because life and death means nothing outside of them. In his stupor, he's emotionally stunted. He's unable to cry, and for a while, he's even un unable to write. When he finally can write, it's only to fuel his anger, not to confront his trauma. Instead of looking inside and using his writing as a way to heal and express himself, his words are turned outwards, his goal being to be as grotesque and violent as humanly possible to try to make everybody else understand. He also sees it as a way to quench the thirst that civilians seem to have for the spectacle of battle, which is something that he also used to crave and now despises. On top of the survivor's guilt that he carries after having lost all of his men. He also has the physical scarring and he fears that he wasted his years of beauty. Before the song, while on leave in his uniform, he was presented with a white feather. So I think I forgot to mention this earlier, but Gaunt was being pressured by his family to enlist, but he still wasn't going to until on his way home, somebody, one of these women handed him a white feather, which was meant to be like a chicken feather, as in you're being cowardly for not devoting your life to the war effort. And while Ellie is home on leave one time and he's getting his uniform cleaned, he's in civilian clothes and he gets presented with a white feather, which sends him into incredible 
anger because this woman has assumed that he's not in the military. But after the psalm, he feels at least a little bit vindicated by the fact that nobody is ever going to assume that about him again. As he tries to get used to his new appearance, which he hates, but to be fair, he kind of hates everything at that point in time, he feels equally smug and disgusted that the proof of his time in the war is forever on his face. After the psalm, Ellie is hardly a shell of the man he used to be. And after him and Gaunt are reunited, Gaunt is of course hoping for the Ellie that he knew and loved and not finding him. Instead, seeing the body of the Ellie that he knew and loved, minus an eye, but feeling so disconnected from his inside. He has a conversation with Ellie's doctor once Ellie has fallen asleep, asking if he'll ever recover. And here's, I'm actually going to read the quote for that because it's a pretty disgusting conversation and shows just how much we have progressed in our understanding of shell shock, trauma, and PTSD since the First World War and because of the First World War. This is from page 343. As he lay in bed, Elwood rigid and pretending to sleep beside him, Gaunt reflected that it did not feel like loving Elwood. It felt like loving a brittle imposter, one who had stolen Ellie and would not return him. And yet, Gaunt was powerless. He loved every part of Elwood, changed or not. If there were a lonelier feeling, he could not imagine it. In the hospital, he had spoken to Ellie's doctor. Will he recover, he asked, in the corridor outside of his ward. Oh, if it weren't for that eye, we send him straight back, said the doctor, looking at the clipboard. From the shell shock, I mean. Shell shock like that never harmed a soldier, said the doctor cheerfully. It's a shame we can't pass him for active duty. The man's a machine. After Ellie is released from the hospital later in the book, they end up uh, meeting another parachute friend for lunch at the school itself, even though they're out for the summer. So they're talking about Hayes. Glad to be of service. I know I've been a bit out of sorts since the psalm. How did your friend, David Hayes, fare? Pulverized hips, said Elwood. He's not answered any of my letters. He smiled, although it was too angry. Writes to Gaunt, though. We ought to visit him, said Gaunt. Hip wounds are tricky, said Rosevere. He won't walk again, said Elwood. It's my hands I'm most worried about, said Rosevere. I think I could manage anything but that. Sight, said Gaunt. I'm terrified of blindness. Elwood's profile was caught in the light. From this angle, he looked whole, angelic. My face, he said. There was a long silence. Well, you always were a vain bugger, said Rosevere. Glad to see nothing's changed. Gaunt waited for Elwood to laugh before he let himself join in. But the trauma really isn't just for the soldiers. I mean, a lot of it is, most of it is. But even though Ellie's mother kind of sucks in some ways, um, you do have to feel bad for her when she has literally no idea how to interact with her son at all. Before the war, they were very, very close. And even the boys who have not yet, or hopefully never will, go to war, they don't really know how to deal with this trauma either. On page 164, in a letter from Rosevere before he has enlisted to Ellie, after he has enlisted, he says, The school is so strange after the prosciutting comes out. No one knows how long to wait before behaving normally again. For the younger boys, the period of dignified quiet seems to grow shorter and shorter. For the upper school, it stretches longer each issue. We know more of the dead, I suppose, and looking round at each other, wondering which of us will join their ranks in the coming year. Okay, so at this point, the bulk of our story has wrapped up. Neither of them have to go back to the front, thanks to their injuries, but it's only 1916. They basically go to train new recruits. So they're still in the army, they're just not at the front anymore. At a couple different points throughout the book, there's kind of been this side conversation happening about again, a different gay couple that was planning to move to Brazil after the war because in Brazil, it's not illegal to be gay. There actually is an opportunity for the two of them to get some jobs in Brazil after the war through a friend's dad. As they are parting ways to go train recruits uh, for the next two years, Gaunt gives Ellie a letter telling him that he's serious about what it says and that when the war is over, he wants to take up Cyril's offer and move to Brazil together. It's still not acceptable there and it requires careful concealment, but it isn't punishable by death. 
Though they're no longer in the trenches, these two years before the war ends still really isn't a great opportunity for them to begin healing with the future being so unknown. They have no idea how long the war is still going to last. We have the benefit of hindsight. So they part ways and then our next part, we flash forward to Gaunt and Ellie a few months after the war has ended. They just moved to Brazil and they're very much unsure of how to be around each other. They've had two years apart and before that, they'd only had a couple months together after they were entirely fucked up. And before that, they were children. So although it was his idea, Gaunt still kind of struggles with being in Brazil. Gaunt used to dream of Germany and miss Germany. While it was Ellie who was really obsessed with and proud of and loved England. But Gaunt grew to love England, or at least the England that he saw through Ellie's eyes, because Ellie's England was magical. And this shift represents his internal turmoil, unsure of whether the Ellie that he once loved will ever actually return, let alone return to him. As he has quoted many times throughout the book from his boy Thucydides, war is a violent teacher. Meanwhile, Ellie, who used to love England, now hates England and wants England to hate him back where England once harbored his naive and nationalistic idealism, it now seems unworthy of the sacrifices that have been made for it. When he first ventures out in public after his injury has begun to heal, he purposely wanted himself to look as grotesque as possible, hoping to project his hatred for the place so much that England will hate him back and give him a reason to never return. By the end of their journeys, both men have strayed so far from the ideals and philosophies that they carried before the war, but they still mostly disagree on everything, which has been a constant throughout the entire book. While Ellie once saw life as pastoral and simple, the war has forced his eye for beauty to gaze on the unignorable ugliness that Gaunt has been aware of all along. But while Gaunt has always seen this ugliness as something to be acknowledged, Ellie has now gone a step further to think that it's something that should not only be acknowledged but celebrated and used as a warning not to repeat the same mistakes. Meanwhile, Gaunt was so caught up in the philosophy and politics of it from the very start, before he was even being pressured into joining it. He felt that things were operating at such a scale that he had no way of getting out of participation. Now he's learned that with intentionality and patience and practice, life within these systems can be simple if you choose it. There can be joy and gentleness and love if only you carve out a space and allow yourself the permission to embody it. We end with a letter from Maud, who has returned to Berlin in order to follow her dreams of being a politician and truly committing to never marrying. I don't know if I brushed on it that much, but Gaunt and Maud have always had a really difficult time communicating, and part of this was over Gaunt's jealousy of her and Elwood's relationship, although he never had anything to be jealous over. And he talks about how he just doesn't know how to speak to his sister. And he never even actually tells her about his feelings for Ellie until she asks him. And then he's able to finally say what he's been wanting to say. He actually thanks her for asking because he says that had she not asked, he never would have said so. She's now dedicated the rest of her life to making the world better for people like her brother. In Berlin, she's involved with the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, which is working to repeal paragraph 175, the law that makes homosexuality punishable by death in Germany. She's also been inspired by the writings of Edward Carpenter, who was very ahead of his time and out there, um, who posited that homosexuality is inherently a more pure and selfless version of love than heterosexuality because there isn't this primal drive for reproduction. She writes this letter to Gaunt talking about how things are looking in Berlin and how she's optimistic for the future, saying that there is a place for you here. You are wanted. And this admission from her really trips Gaunt up because he is missing England. He's missing Germany. He's missing his sister that he desperately wants a closer relationship with. But he's with Ellie and he wants to be with Ellie. And while throughout the story, Ellie has never been able to say no to Gaunt, it's not until this point that we get true confirmation that Gaunt has also never been able to say no to Ellie. So when Ellie asks for him to stay, for them to stay forever, he says yes, and he's satisfied with that choice. So our boys do get a happy ending. 
they stay in Brazil for the rest of their lives. Is the social understanding of homosexuality in this book necessarily super accurate? There's really nobody who is truly hateful about Ellie and Gaunt's relationship, which is a little bit unlikely. But you know what? It's historical romance. I don't really want to hear about people getting hate crimed, so I'm fine with it personally. It is really unfortunate because although we end on a happy ending for our boys, there are some implications about what happens to Maud, right? She's in Berlin. She's working with the progressive group. The war has just ended. She has about 15 years until things start to get a little dicey over there. And because of the nature of her work, it's very likely that Maud would have got caught up as Hitler ascended. If you've made it this far into the video, thank you so much for hanging out as I rant about this thing that has taken over my mind for the past couple of weeks. Um, if you want to hear more media analysis, go ahead and give this video a like, subscribe. This is the kind of stuff I love talking about, and it's literally why I switched to just going headfirst into long-form content. If you haven't already, please read this book. Please read this book. That I'm, I'm begging you to read this book. If you have read this book, please tell me your thoughts, okay? I need somebody to talk to you about this because, as you can tell, I have a lot of them. <laughs> With that, I'm going to go. Um, thanks for hanging out. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!